verifying learning, which I think is a major problem that we've just signified, is they're still verifying learning and the skill set ability by what, like, Cambridge have you done, or IB system have you done, or what university have you done? So, no, I think, yes, very fair point, but I also think a lot of universities nowadays are realizing that everyone has the same learning, mm. and everyone's done the A levels, and might not get the same thing, but everyone's basically learned all yeah. the same subject. What really separates people is now the, what is the YouTube outside. videos that you've watched or yeah. the podcasts that you've watched. Yeah, welcome to Hustle's Global Interview. I'm here with Jenk Oz. We've been chatting for the past year or so over LinkedIn and social media. I made a trip to London and uh, I had to see him. I kind of bombarded him with emails. I think he's so tired of me <laughs> um, trying to chase for the interview, but it's so awesome to be here and congrats on all your amazing work well thank you very much for having me very excited to talk to you today and uh welcome welcome to london i guess yeah absolutely so uh we'll start off where did this all start well i think this originally started with uh alongside the first website that i built which is called i cool kid and yeah. to put a very long story short the idea with like cool kid was I wanted to make a website about cool things to do in london for kids and alongside that came a lot of videos we were making and uh, this was the original concept behind this was just as a place to a cool place to look at to as a background for videos and then it kind of evolved as a kind of thing started like t-shirts i grew out of started to get onto the walls and all the graffiti and skateboards and stuff and then uh, as i took up a passion for music and dj that kind of dj section over yeah. there developed and then we got the drums guitars and whatnot uh, so this room itself was really originally meant for videoing, but it's kind of become just a kind of a create a manifestation of whatever kind of passions I have. Um, and then kind of just talking more generally about what kind of we're up to, um, I cool kid slowly evolved into what is thread now. Yeah. And uh, kind of just speaking about thread now, thread is effectively it's, four things it's a publishing media consulting and production company all of which is aimed at generation z um the central tenant of the website the central tenant of the business is the website which is thread.com which is a kind of 100 percent social change focused website and the idea is to inform inspire and impact the most amount of like-minded people possible because look i think there definitely needs to be a lot of world change and i don't think that's going to happen through one specific person i think that's going to happen if everyone enacts local change on a global scale and the way that we want to do that through thread is by inspiring the most amount of people to take that local change yeah. so uh that's the, that's the uh the idea behind thread and uh yeah here you are in the studio and yeah we were chatting before this about because i mean i'm sure a lot of people are they look at my journey and they kind of say mark where did it, where, always the question is where did it all start and why did you start it and looking at your journey in terms of why you started and and, and i think both of us the big question is like I want to ask, you know, ponder on this for us is, do you think you were born an entrepreneur or do you think you can build yourself into having this mindset about creating and solving? Because most people at our age right now, they're sitting in class, right? And they're studying and they're pursuing other passions, which is absolutely brilliant. But why, like, why, did, why are you choosing to be here in this moment? I don't think anyone really chooses to become an entrepreneur. And I think it's actually quite a big mistake that people say, if you set out to become an entrepreneur, the success won't happen and nothing's going to happen there. The way that entrepreneurs come about is where you see a gap in the market or you have an idea and you ideate and you develop. And entrepreneurship is where an idea meets execution. Yes. So no one sets out to say, I want to start a business. Someone sets out to say, I want to find a place that I can talk to my friends about what are the cool things to do in London. That place doesn't exist. I'm going to build that website. And then that execution in itself was that entrepreneurial journey. So I don't think that anyone really sets out to become an entrepreneur, which is why I don't think that entrepreneurs are created or do I think entrepreneurs are born. I think it's just someone who has an idea and execute on the idea. That's an entrepreneur. Okay. And in terms of starting, like evaluating, because a lot of people have amazing ideas. I meet young people, and you meet young people mm -hmm. all the time. They have the most incredible ideas to start to form, form things that are going to change the world. Like what, what is it that, allowed you or made you take that first step at such a young age because you didn't have to start this business now you can start when you're 30 40 i actually think and people don't really always understand well not that they don't understand it people don't always realize this is it's so much easier when you're younger yeah because you're no one's relying on you to put food onto a table you don't have to provide for anyone you're living with your parents i mean i'm like 17 i'm not gonna live on my own i like you go to school you're still in education so you're, you're hardly busy 
And uh, I'm specifically, I, I'm in school for just over six months of the year and out of school for just under six months of the year. So I have kind of so much time to spare. Yeah. And um, there, there really is no better time to get started. And another reason why that's the case is because of uh, something called cloud computing. So companies like AWS and Oracle have created cloud computing. But what it means is that the cost of failing a business nowadays is a tenth what it was 10 years ago which in other words means that you can start and fail 10 different businesses for the same price as you could one business just a decade ago, which means that and it's, fur it's further encouraging Generation Z to become even more entrepreneurial. Yes. I think one thing to mention quickly is that I've heard people sometimes talk about saying that everyone in Generation Z is an entrepreneur, but I don't think that's exactly quite the case. I think it's more so that anyone, everyone in Generation Z is entrepreneurial yes and what we have is this this drive to survive effectively this hustle this kind of it, coming into the gig economy we need to have this hustle and it's much less of a kind of standard business model plan where someone will create a business and then they would fast for kind of follow the standard business model and have these huge company wins it's it's not that's not really the case anymore what is happening for generation z is we're we're called practical pragmatists or solopreneurs effectively because we're working with very few other people, if not just ourselves, and we're focused on these small sustainable wins yes. where we can sell our we can we can sell our skills basically on yeah. the market as opposed to these huge kind of company size wins. And I think what's amazing, so both of us do a lot of Gen Z talks and corporate consulting and that. And so looking from a characteristics point of view, Gen Z um, grew up, you know, their parents went through the 2008 crash and they are realizing that they have to make money. You know, at a younger age, they're wanting to make money. They're wanting to start putting financial plan in place before even going to university. Um, and I think that, like, we maybe not didn't form that. It was just in us, you know, subconsciously as we were navigating life. Mm -hmm. We were like, we got to create, we got to, um, even if from a financial pressure, just from like a world, like seeing the world and the internet, as you mentioned, like since the internet came, we can do anything. Yeah. You know, we wouldn't be able to never connect. It would have taken us way longer in terms of word of mouth and referable. We connected online. We both built Gen Z companies. Um, and that's it's such an amazing opportunity. Yeah. And what do you, like, if, if, if someone's listening to this right now and they have ideas or they're wanting to get into the space, like, what is your recommendation for young people? Like, where do they start? Both of us listen to a lot of podcasts and are developing ourselves. Like, where do, you, where do they start as a young person? Sorry, what? Where in terms start? of, like, their business journey, in terms of uh, finding yeah, their yeah. career path. I think... Um, I don't know, the reason I said I just listened to a Simon Sinek podcast with Steve Bartlett, so I'm very in the Simon Sinek headspace right now. But the, the things that he talks about is start with why, and the reason that people don't start with why is because everyone knows kind of what they want to do. Everyone knows how they work. Some people know how they're going to do it, yeah. but very few people know why they do something. Yes. And that's the kind of the, the the idea that he coined. But I think the way that you find that, and the way that I found that at least, was writing down your ideas I think is the best way to start because if you can force yourself to what I call is like create like a storyboard of your idea so you effectively you write down a post-it note or a piece of paper something every day force yourself to add to it every day for 30 straight days and then by the end of those 30 straight days yes. you're gonna have this huge wall wherever it may be your garage your room or whatever you're gonna have this huge wall of all these ideas you've accumulated over the last 30 days. They're all gonna be developing on each other. They're gonna be kind of arrows and like kind That's of crossing out. Exactly. And then by the end of that, you've got so many ideas that you can get to a point where you say, okay, here's all my ideas. Now I'm gonna say, you know what? This we're not gonna do. We're gonna hone. We're gonna deepen, shape, and hone are the three things I like to say. So you wanna get deep into your idea to better understand what it really is. Shape your idea so it's yeah. as focused as it can be and then hone in on exactly what your idea is. And I think one of the ways that you can achieve that is, and this is something I always like to recommend, is the same way that some people might have an ide a career board of directors, you want to have an idea board of yes. directors. So you want to find a group of people of different ages and life experiences who you feel comfortable talking to about your idea. Because if you can force yourself to talk about your idea and, and almost defend your idea, it's going to make it a lot stronger, whether you're... When you whether you change it or not, it's going to make it a lot stronger. Absolutely. So uh, I think the the things I would say is create a storyboard of your idea, write down your ideas, um, deepen, shape, and hone, and make a, make an idea board of directors, people who you feel comfortable talking to. 
Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of like both our companies, the more we talk about it, the more clarity we get, we more understand because people come to me and they're like, well, I've got this idea, but I don't know where it's going to lead or what it's going to form. Like, how do I exactly that? Yeah. You know, the more you write it down, the more you visualize it, the more you talk about it with potential consumers, with advisors, with friends. Um, so yeah, brilliant. In terms of yourself, what do you think are your three greatest skills or your ability? It's huh. a great question. I think... Uh, for, from a kind of, uh, from this standpoint, I think generally public speaking has been something I really really enjoyed doing, yeah. and I think that the amount that I <laughs> the amount that I do it, be, I, I think I'd struggle if I if I didn't really enjoy it quite a lot. So I think public speaking is probably one of my biggest things. Uh, time organization, I think I've kind of it's be, kind of become second nature to me to schedule everything. But some people kind of look at what I do and they're like, "How do you how do you fit this into a day?" But yeah. when you figure it kind of, when you figure out, I think the key to that is really just scheduling because I'm a very firm believer that if you know what you're going to do on the day before you do it, it's much more likely to get done. Get done correct. Yeah, exactly. And um, I feel like people who kind of say, "Oh, I will do this, this, and this at some point in the next week," or they they set these huge to do mm. lists for stuff to do over like the coming month. Yeah. Like really, by the end of the month, you get nothing done. Whereas if you say, "In this hour, I'm going to do this." Yeah. It's a lot easier. And to just to done. comment on that as well, it's like, I think both of us have got this mindset of we have set habits way before perhaps other people, like for instance, in the way I look at my schedule and the way I look at my time is like, I'm worth a billion dollars and my company's got a thousand employees, right? And the same as you is, hey, okay, cool. I'll add you to my Google calendar. Hey, we need to schedule this. Hey, we need to communicate this. We need a plan. Like, I think a lot of young people, they don't think about that stuff. You know, even if they're small, they just say, oh, because I'm small and I'm just starting out. But if you set those habits in play, the more likely you to execute on your ideas. Yeah. And yeah, I yeah. think that's your third biggest skill is from my point of view is like you execute. When you set something, when you so. think about it, you do <laughs> I <hope> it. So. <laughs> um, and that's, that's why you're able to get to this place now where you're speaking and you've, you've got clarity in your business and your business is growing. Um, what do you think, what, what, what do you think, like in terms of your starting your journey, what would you have, you wanted to start with, like earlier, start doing earlier? If you could go back. I really don't know. I think that, and like, people have asked me this question before, like, yeah. oh, it's the same question, like, do you have any regrets almost? Yeah, yeah. I really don't think that, having looked at everything we've done in the past and the way that everything's played out and how that's accumulated to where we are now, yeah. I really don't think I could, I could change anything or do anything sooner. Cool. If I in think. terms of finding mentors, let's have a look at that. Yeah. So key. I think it's firstly the most underestimated thing because people assume that, well, people assume one of two things. They assume that they can do everything on their own and that's what, that's like what type A is for someone who thinks they can yes, do everything on their own yes. and they don't need anyone to help. And then type B, and they could be the same person, mm. is someone who assumes that no one wants to help them. Yeah. And quite often you'll find that very few people in type A and very few people in type B will ever succeed. Yeah. Uh, well, at least to kind of a, a kind of quick and healthy extent, I think that what you want to be is you want to be a person who, firstly, knows that people want to help you, and I think that's what a, a big issue nowadays. On a more general point, to be fair, is that young people who are trying to start businesses will massively undersell themselves, mm -hmm. and they will underplay themselves, and they will assume that people don't want to give them the time of the day because they're younger. And what I actually found was that actually people want to give you more time of day because you're younger, because people are more empathetic to your mistakes. People understand that you haven't got a degree in business, yes. so they're not. So they're going to teach you things, yes. and like the, the things that I've learned, which I, I like, I, I would like to think that a degree could kind of never teach you from people. Just people talking to me and people assuming that because you're small, you can just not small as it because you're like younger, yes. they can just teach you things, and yes. you're going to be kind of happy to know that the things I've learned from that is really quite like priceless almost. So I think the first point about kind of age is don't underplay yourself. Yeah. Especially and leverage if you're young. Uh, yeah, precisely. We both exactly. leverage them, I, right? Kind of, I really massively attribute to the, the early success of our cool kid massively to the age that I started it at because of the purely the amount of press that we got. I mean, like, I think it's like the Sun or the Daily Mail, some very reputable um, uh, news source labeled me as the UK's youngest CEO. Yeah. And then past that, it was like, Oh, like easy breezing and that was kind of and even speaking you know when they see that you're 16 17 everyone, people would be everyone like, wants to listen oh, to no me. one wants to hire me well, i'm too young i'm too inexperienced but everyone wants to hire you. yeah it, it was most, it's not because a lot of people will want to listen to i would want to listen to a 13 year old who's done x y and z as opposed to a 30 year old who's done x y and z so it, i think age massively helped and i think people who underplay themselves mm. it, it, please do not do that yeah. is my first advice so sorry that was that was type b i, I think i backtracked slightly there 
Um, and then type A, people who think they don't need any help, that's just, again, not the case. Mm. And especially if you're young, that's not the case. You need even more help if Correct. you're young. Because I think someone who's young has the advantages of being young, but also has the disadvantages yes. of being young. And the disadvantages are very, very, very easily solved mm. by having a mentor. Or two, or three, or ten mentors. Or how many people you want to talk to. Or call them even friends. You or know? just people who you can get advice from. And I think that, uh, as I'm talking about finding mentors, I really, really, we were talking about this earlier, I think LinkedIn is truly the greatest the greatest social media platform on earth for anything professional, especially for young people. Yeah. Firstly, Generation Z is the largest growing cohort on LinkedIn right now. So you're going to find uh, people who say there's no one Generation Z on LinkedIn, they're lying. Yeah. It's just not true. There are. And um, I think the thing about LinkedIn is you find the most passionate people. And the reason you have that is because, no offense to Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, but people go on Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok to kind of, they spend their time there, they scroll, yeah, yeah. They, they consume. Whereas LinkedIn, you give. Yeah. It's an engagement. Yeah. It's it's you, No one goes on LinkedIn to just like surf the web. Yeah, you ex the expectation is to collaborate. Well, exactly. You, to... you, com you see these huge long comments about people replying to what someone has thought about. Yeah. And like, that's just the vibe on LinkedIn. Yeah. So what I found is that actually, I found a lot of my mentors through LinkedIn. And even people who I won't consider a mentor, people who I've just got advice from yes. from LinkedIn yes. are, uh, yeah. All through, all through that. So. Yeah, I think it's a massive point. Just touching on LinkedIn for a sec, like even from jobs, like, it's awesome. Young people, I can't understand how they say they can't find a job. In South Africa, it's a major thing where it's like, oh, there's not enough jobs, and you know, you need these fancy degrees and that. But like, if I think about, like, I know if my business fails, I can get a job anywhere just using LinkedIn, right? Mm. Um, and reaching out and building a brand. I want to go into talking about a brand now because. You've built such an incredible brand, but uh, I think every young person should be leveraging LinkedIn more um, and spending too. time there. And it's funny because you just mentioned about like the growing use of Gen Z. People think TikTok's the biggest, but actually, uh, the growing fastest growing is thirty five to fifty five on TikTok, which is yeah. really really interesting. Which Gary V mentions. Really? Um, so uh, yeah, talking about your brand, how did you do it in terms of like building social proof, building your Instagram out? Um, I had a really weird experience with my Instagram, and I'll tell you this because it's funny. Yeah. But um, I originally started by, and I, there's like so many weird points about this. You have to think about your Instagram when you're growing it. Is it a means to an end or is it the end? Yes. And for me, it's always been a means to an end because the idea of my Instagram was always to just drive following to the website, whether it was like or thread at the time. So that was kind of, in my head, I always thought I just want to get loads of followers and then if I post every now and again, about thread, they're all going to go and, mm. and Bob's your auntie, we're going to have big traffic. Hurrah. That didn't happen. <laughs> because the content that I would use to build up my Instagram to get loads of followers is not the content that attracts people who want to be on thread. Yeah. Funny enough. So I end up posting all these like modeling photos because like, I used to model quite a bit and it's like all these photos of me just, just instagram -y, like looking, I'd like to think quite like just like, just, <laughs> just, like, good, like good photos, right? Yeah. And then I get like I had like a hundred something thousand followers at some point, and then and I knew how the audience worked, and I always thought it was a good high engagement audience until one day when I shaved all my hair off and I lost twenty thousand followers oh in like word. a month. I lost four thousand followers in an hour because I put a story up of me shaving my head. But the uh, the point is. The reason why that wasn't working for me was because the audience that I'd accumulated from posting those photos yeah. and videos wasn't the audience that I wanted because Instagram wasn't the end. It was the means to an end. So now you look at my Instagram and it's all social change videos. It's effectively just videos of me talking or be clips from this or be something or other like that yeah. purely about social change. So and then now I'm at like whatever it is, 70 something thousand followers. And but, but those 70 thousand followers are the type of followers who are engaged with what you're doing. And the reason that's good is because at the end of the day, those are the followers who are going to use your Instagram to get to your website. Yeah, and support and, you whether you've got hair or not. Well, and, precisely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whether I've got a bus come or not, yeah. then they're going to be there. So I think the point is with Instagram I want to make is, and a brand in total is, mm -hmm. create a brand that matches where you're wanting to send them. Yeah. Because for it, Instagram for me has always been a means to an end. Mm -hmm. I'm not a professional Instagrammer. So it's always been a way to get traffic to the thread. And the way that I've done that, and well, the way that I failed to do that is now the way that I've done that by understanding the audience. And I think also just touching on, on his brand specifically, I've been following him for a while and taking notes in that way I can. But uh, he, Cenk, is so much more than 
the 70,000 followers on Instagram, oh, okay. right? The, his, his name, the relationships he's built. Um, and so if Instagram closes tomorrow, I have no doubt that you'll be able to still have a following and still community. And if you want to sell an event, you can sell an event. Okay. And that being because of how you engage with mm. people, right? And so you're reaching out a lot. You're spending time with your followers. You're engaging in conversations. You're speaking on so many podcasts and live events. Yeah. Um, and I think those are some of the key components that young people need to think about. Like I, I went on 20 podcasts the last month and all you have to do is reach out. Yeah. Like you, your people ask what personal branding is. It's your story. It's you. Yeah. And every single day when you're sharing, running out, I don't know, on the street and playing games and in the, on the, you know, getting DJs um, and then you're shopping or whatever it is, like that is your personal brand. Yeah. And so for young people wanting to look to post and what do I do and how do I do it? Just do you. Yeah. Because people were attracted to that and whether they, if they don't like you, then they, they must unfollow you and they're following the wrong account. Those are all the people that you want to support. Um, and you've done that so, so well. Just being authentically jank. No, massively. I really appreciate that. I'm glad that you, you see that. So thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> what is one, let's talk about social change and mm-hmm. the reason like, so you're really passionate about that, obviously. Maybe you want to explain exactly the mission behind that and your thinking and your belief and kind of what you're wanting to change in the world regarding that. Well, uh, I'll kind of talk about So I think social change, just to clarify, is the, the definition, effectively, is the change in cultural and social patterns over time. So effectively, what's considered the norm. Um I think that it's very clear to see that you can go on the news on any second of the day on any on any channel you choose, and you can see that a lot of change needs to happen in the world. And the reason behind Thread, and I mentioned this earlier, is uh, I love absolutely love Greta Thunberg. I think she's brought a huge, huge amount to the world. I think she's brought attention to things that you to to something that previously didn't have as much attention as it deserved. Completely, absolute credit to her. Her herself, I don't think, is gonna hugely solve climate change the people who are going to solve climate change are the people who are taking that taking what they learn from Greta Thunberg or whoever it may be about whatever topic and they're applying that to everyday lives and they're applying that to their local area yes so that they're who I like to call like the local the local action takers and if you can make the most amount of those local action takers then those are the people who are going to make the change and if you can have that on a global scale that's how you achieve global change so that's kind of the idea behind Thread, as I said before, is, is to inspire those people to make local change. Okay, brilliant. And in terms of like, what most frustrates you right now about society? Oh, crikey. I think the topics that I'm most passionate about are, and this is probably just a manifestation of my age and what I live with, but I think there's a lot that needs to change within the education system. I think both on a purely educational level and on a social change level. But uh, yeah. Well, let's let's quickly just touch touch on that. Like, mm-hmm. so I think on a social change level, I think the the fact that we're not teaching the UN sustainability goals, or you you can't kind of the amount of people who you could go to in the UK right now and who wouldn't know a what the UN sustainability goals are, like just what even like what is, is that? that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What even is that? And then the people who can't name at least a couple of them, like that number is is completely nuts to me, and it tells you that you can broadcast it to as many people as you want, but the people who are preventing the change from happening are the people who don't even know that it's 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 in it's in action. Yeah. So I think that in itself tells you that we need to change. We need to educate people because I don't think there are people who are saying. And this is the one of the nice things about social change is that no one says the world's fine right now. Yeah. We need to not change. We're we're pretty well where we're at. We're fine. No, nothing needs to happen. Everyone is like yes. They're acknowledging the problem. Everyone though. acknowledges the problem. Yeah. It's just. Some people just have no clue. It's not like you explain the issue about of, of like whatever climate change to someone, and they say no, that's fine. So everyone knows that the problem is there. Yeah. It's just that people need to a understand the problem better, and then everyone needs to kind of. I think it needs to be more accessible. Yeah, exactly. Take, yeah, for sorry, people more to do that. Yeah. More completely, it needs to be much more accessible. The yeah. knowledge needs to be much more accessible, and the ways of solving it. Right, it's Precisely. great. To, it's great to identify these big problems, but if you're not giving people the opportunity to do it, exactly, exactly. No, I completely agree. And then, so that's how social change. The other issue I have is about the education system. Is and I can rant about this all day, so you have to you have to hold me back at some point. But look, at the end of the day, oh, there's two main things. To be fair, at the end of the day, it's very very easy to spot a performer or a musician or an academic or an athlete very very early on. So you can give them the coaching and the training and the facilities that they need to succeed and become Olympic athletes or professional musicians or whatnot. 
it's very hard to identify an entrepreneur or an innovator. So they are left to ideate in relative isolation. So what we're having is this, and this was a, a topic called Lost Einsteins, coined by Raj Chetty, I believe. He's like a Harvard or Stanford professor. Well, I think a Stanford professor. And um, he said, look, we, we're expecting all these people to make huge amounts of changes, but we're not fostering the people who are going to make the biggest differences in the world. Yeah. We're not allowing them to make big differences because we're not helping them. So effectively, if you kind of recall about 10 minutes ago, I was talking about type A and B, people who people aren't able to get the mentors yes. because no one is seeing that this person has a really, really good idea and it has that mindset of execution. Well, they can't express it, you know? Exactly, as well. So um, I think that's one of my biggest issues, that it's no, there's no one helping young entrepreneurs and young innovators unless they're vocal enough to be able to say, I have this idea, someone please help me. Where are you? Thank God for like, this interview and Hustles Global and yeah, uh, Thread yeah, Magazine. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so that's my first issue with the education system. The second one's a bit more long-winded, but effectively, it's very clear to see that the, 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 the employability landscape is changing massively. Mm. The gig economy is growing at three times greater than the workforce, and 800 million jobs are going to be lost globally by 2030 to AI and automation, and 80% of the jobs needed for 2030's economy haven't even been created and scaled yeah. yet. So no one is denying the fact that the world in 2030 is going to look very, very different jobs-wise. But the education system, the thing that's meant to prepare us to yeah. get jobs, hasn't changed in like 50, and 60 years. And to educate years. us, most people don't know these stats. They don't know these facts. Well, exactly. But the syllabus hasn't changed in yeah. 50 or 60 years. So you're teaching the same things to someone who's 60 years old, uh, to come on, who's 80 now, learn mm. the same things when they mm. were 18 as we're learning now. Mm. And you can't tell me that that's... That's correct, because yeah. the, when they were 18, they were going into the workforce. Well, sorry, when the 80-year-old was 18 and they were going into the workforce, they were looking at a completely different set of jobs that we're looking into. Yeah. I think the second issue I have with the education system is about just the fact that, look, at the end of the day, employability has taken a huge, huge upturn, and it's completely flipped upside down on its head. I mean, 800 million jobs are going to be lost globally to AI and automation, 80% of the jobs needed for 2030's economy haven't been created in scale yet, and the gig economy is growing at three times the rate of the traditional workforce, okay? So all of those things are, are showing that employability is nothing like it was just five, six years ago. Yeah. Having said that, the syllabus, the thing that we learn in school for however many years of our life to prepare us for employability and to help us get a job, that that hasn't changed in the last 50 or 60 years. Yeah. People who are 80 now are learning the same things in their chemistry A level or whatever that we are today. But the, when they were getting a job, they were looking at a whole different set of jobs which they wanted to apply to than we are today. And I think it's a really, really big issue because, I mean, I mean Generation Z is going to have a very big issue when we when we're finish it when all of us are in the workforce because we haven't been educated to go into the workforce that we're going to go into. And I think it's a really, really big issue with, the, with uh, well, the current education system. Speaking on that, I'm going to challenge you because, well, we both did Cambridge. We both are doing Cambridge. Um, and I think a major challenge is like alternatives. Yeah. So we say like, okay, cool. You know, what education are we going to do? Or like the education system doesn't work, right? But what alternatives do people have? Because the fact is that you still, universities, as you were talking before, still look at academic standards and what university, um, what like academics you went through and what you study at school, um, even in life and jobs. And so even though they're changing the future, I think there's this major like fear around young people like not having enough or, or they're not going to get a job or they're not going to have enough money. So for yourself, like why, firstly, why are you studying Cambridge and where do you like, what is alternatives for young people? Um, well, I was studying because I just want to kind of get the best kind of education possible, but mainly because I also really enjoy the subject I do. So that's the because I'm doing my A levels now. So that's the kind but of. But it's outdated. You don't, don't you think it's outdated? That yeah, but I learning? think uh, to be fair, I think an understanding of the things that we're learning, I find just quite interesting. I don't think it'll be useful in the okay, job. So you're not doing it because it's no, no, no. I don't think I don't think I'm not doing it for you. Just enjoy the learning process. I, just, and I enjoy the subjects that I take, and I think that. Some of them are really useful. I think some yeah. of them will be... Sorry, let me rephrase. When I say not useful, I don't mean completely just useless. Rubbish, yeah. I think that not it doesn't. we're not being taught in a way that is going to make us the most employable people. If that makes sense. Like, I do economics, politics, maths, and physics. 
I don't think I'm going to need physics many, many... I don't think I'm going to need physics a huge amount of times for the rest of my life. Nor do I think I'm going to need kind of trigonometry and maths in the rest of, of a huge amount for the rest of my life. But politics, economics, an understanding of the political system, yeah. an understanding of how the kind of the economic... The, the kind of how the flow of money works and how just that whole concept or world works, I think that's really, really useful. So I think the things that we learn at A-level, although might not be completely di- like kind of directly, directly yeah. involved Linked in... Linked to in, the future work. Precisely. I think that they're, uh, they are useful, which is why I want to do them. And, and they build the foundation yeah, precisely. for your learning. You, see, you made a point about alternatives and the lack mm. of, and I think that, that actually, in a sense, is... And I don't know whether you said there are alternatives or there aren't. No, aren't, aren't. I'd argue that there definitely are. Because if okay. you're, say you're a DJ, or you wanted to produce music, you can, well, and, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take a step back. You can learn anything on YouTube. Yeah. And literally, if you can type it, you can learn it on YouTube. And I really passionately, but like, it, the YouTube is the biggest democratization of education. Yes. Without a doubt. Yes. Because... If you have internet connectivity, which a large proportion of the world does, admittedly not all, but we know that, and we're kind of, that's one of the things that I think we should work on as is, is the world, is uh, if you have connectivity, you can learn anything. I mean, you have LinkedIn lessons, Coursera, Masterclass, Skillshare. Podcasts. I mean, I mean anything like yeah. that. But even the four I just mentioned are specifically for skills that aren't taught in schools. Yeah. They're, you can like sign up for a course about how to make a house beat and then, I mean, you can be the Martin Garrix who wrote, yes. I think he wrote like Animals at 17 yeah. on a train somewhere on his laptop. And then here we are kind of years and years later thinking, you obviously all know the song. Mm. Uh, and he doesn't, he doesn't, he, I don't think he took like music tech or whatever. Yeah. Like there's no, my point is you don't need the A-levels. I think there's a lot of things that you can, there's classes and courses that you can take yes. where you can learn pretty well anything. Yeah. I and, think, uh, I yeah. think, to touch on that, I think I agree. I agree with you. Those are the alternatives, and I, if there's anyone who's done them at the greatest extent, it's myself. Right, being in South Africa and listening to hundreds of podcasts a month because yeah. I didn't want to sit in Afrikaans and I didn't want to sit in these other academic classes that I had nothing to do with what I want to do. Right, and so I've leveraged those, but I still think when we're looking realistically at um, jobs, I mean, looking realistically at like getting into university, they don't in the, I've never seen any university application where it says, how many YouTube videos have you watched? Yeah. Or how many, which podcasts have you listened to, right? So they're still verifying learning, which I think is a major problem that we've just signified is they still verifying learning and the skill set ability by what like Cambridge have you done or IB system have you done or what university have you done so no, I think yes very fair point but I also think a lot of universities nowadays are realizing that everyone has the same learning mm-hmm. and everyone's done the A-levels and might not get the same thing but everyone's basically learned all yeah. the same subject what really separates people is now the, what is the YouTube outside. videos that you've watched or yeah. the podcasts that you've watched because if two people go into an interview for a physics degree at whatever university and one of them is talking about the things they learn on the syllabus yes. and they know stone cold and one of them is slightly less stone cold on the syllabus but listen to every physician's podcast and learns about astrology in their free time and ha- is able to to riff off and talk about physics as opposed uh, outside of the given curriculum those are the people who are going to do well and those people who are well just more interested to talk to to be honest yeah. so i think well, i think that's what we've done well well, both of well us, i also think that yeah i was going to say that like with univer- I think you're saying that they're not people aren't being rewarded for that extra knowledge or that yeah. listening to the YouTube videos as you gave. But I, I actually kind of want to contend that and say that actually the interview process for wherever you want to go mm-hmm. to, whether it be a job, a school, or for anything, is actually that's where it gets separated out. And I think it's really important because people who can't speak about a topic or people who are, are specifically set to the curriculum are, aren't going to do as well. I think I agree with that. And I think that it, we are seeing that more and more. But there are still certain traditional systems that are, like if you look at big corporates, you know, the EY and the banks and that, they're very traditional in their minds. And the, even people that are in doing the interviews, they're still somewhat backward thinking, right? And so I think that there is still a fear, especially in South Africa, because we, third world country, quite behind, you know, there is this fear of, yeah, I like, like they're looking at how many degrees I have and I can't get a, you can't get like an exec position on an MBA, right? And so I think that's where the world is going. And you're absolutely correct. And I think people, young people, my point I wanted to make was like, young people need to start doing that more because it works and it creates a uniqueness. Yeah. When we look at uniqueness, like what is, like what is unique about Jenk, 
is that you have these other ideas. You mm -hmm. believe in and you've executed on them. I think that's another big thing is to young people is like, if you're wanting to create uniqueness, like for me getting to my university, the only reason I got into any business school, they're all postgrad. Every single person in my class is above 40. Really? And the only reason I got into that was because of what I've created on the side. And so young people, as you mentioned before, due to the internet, they have the opportunity to create. You yeah. can go into TikTok and create any content. You can go into Instagram, LinkedIn, create a newsletter, because you, you can get a domain, $5, $12, sort of website. So uh, like, I think that's something that you've done so incredibly well, and that's created that uniqueness. And then my last point is, like, for people wanting to execute on those ideas that are in school, like, let's, let's quickly do a rundown of your day. I think it'll be quite, quite interesting to see people, like, tell us from when you wake up to when you sleep, what happens. Well, in a, in a normal day, day when you're working. Day, or, with school, okay. with school. Let's say included in school. Oh, if it's school day, then it's I basically I'm a school and all doing school work all day. The whole day. Basically all day. Uh, I'll I'll speak to uh, my mum. I'll kind of go... I mean, I'll do my social media. So I'll do my LinkedIn, Instagram, okay, okay. whatnot. I'll speak to kind of the, the office and what's and stuff like that. So the and team will manage that on school days and yeah, then non-school days? That's... And then because... Uh, and then non-school days, I'm, I'm with kind of the team. Uh, pre-roll the whole time. Right now, less so because I'm revising for my exam, so it's a bit more difficult. But uh, I try and kind of be in and around the team as much as possible and kind of contributing everything I can. But uh, to be honest, my my that's used to be much more the case. Nowadays, I'm slightly more busy doing stuff like this, interviews, podcasts, lots of public speaking, yeah, uh, stuff like that. So my days nowadays are a bit more lent towards public speaking, a bit more lent towards Climb interviews. Meetings. Uh, yeah, precisely. And uh, but uh, I, I generally just try and spend as much time in and around the office as possible. Okay. And then last two questions. Number one, uh, the first one is, what five words describe who Jenkins is? Oh, crikey. Oh, oh, oh. Can I come back to that? Yeah, okay, second cool. question? The second one's been harder, so. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> last 30 seconds to live. What are your last words? Okay, yeah, that one's slightly... Uh, now what I can do, that all I can do. I think... Last words, okay. You want to look in Oh, yeah. Oh, crikey. No, I don't know if I have that kind of, <laughs> that kind of pressure. To laugh um, in the camera while you do it. I think people have always heard me say this, but um, use your media to grow awareness, your voice to drive attention, your privilege to drive purpose, and your limited time on this planet to drive positive social change. Amazing. And then the second one? Oh, I don't know about my, I don't know about my five words. Oh, crikey. Christ, it's quite a lot of pressure. Take your time, that's alright. I genuinely have, I have no idea. Five words, because three words you think, oh, yeah, I can get away okay, with do that. three words, then if you can do three words. Okay, oh, Christy. Um, I'm going to say innovative, creative, and I think with my public speaking, quite affirmative. Okay. That could be my three words. Brilliant. Thank you so much for listening to the Hustles Global interview. We're so excited to be with Jane Goss. Where can they find you, your social links? Uh, so my Instagram is at, oh, is at J-E-N-K dot O-Z, at Jane dot Oz. Uh, my LinkedIn, I believe, is the same. I actually can't remember exactly what my LinkedIn tag is. Uh, but if you just type in Jane Oz, it will come up. And uh, the Instagram for thread is at T-H-R-E-D-M-A-G. Do check that out. And uh, yeah, the website is thread.com, www.thread.com, T-H-R-E-D.com. Brilliant. Thanks so much for doing Thank this. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. There you go.